Hey everyone, welcome to In the Know with Kat Babano. As my guests are joining us, we're going to be talking about Blue Latitudes. It's a program that was started by Amber Sparks and Emily Hazelwood. So they are joining now. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Oh, my goodness. I hope everybody Hi, heard Kat. Hi, Emily. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Where are you based out of? Uh, I'm in Oakland, California. Oh, okay. So we're both California based then. Uh huh. All right. So I guess I'm guessing Amber will join us shortly. She should be. I just talked to her. Let's okay. See if I can. No problem. Let me see if I can call. All right. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, I can. Okay, great. I just talked to her. So there was a Google in the invite. It had a Google Meet, which is this weird thing Google's been doing. So she thought it was a Google Meet, but she's hopping um, on the Zoom now. Okay, no problem. I was concerned about that. I was like, why does this do this? I, I know. It's, you know, it's funny. It's like happened to us many times. We use Google for everything. It's like our lifeblood <laughs> and like this new rollout they have always adds Google Meet as an option to all calendar invites, which is annoying. Gotcha. Makes sense. So how are you doing? You're down in Southern California, right? Yes, in San Diego, sunny San Diego. Um, so it's doing pretty good, although it's been cold down here, but doing pretty good. Yeah, it's been pretty, pretty cool here too. All are you right. originally from Oakland? Mm-hmm. Born and raised. Wow, you don't meet that many native Californians. <laughs> I'm a transplant myself, so that's why I say that. Where are you from? New Hampshire. Oh. Yeah, a little different. That is different. <laughs> I Hi, Amber. Night. Welcome. Good evening. Or good evening, yes. How are you doing? Doing well today. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. Great. Move to an area with more light. Wonderful. Where are you based? <laughs> I'm in Oakland, California. <laughs> oh, great, great. I used to live, uh, I was over in Berkeley, actually. Oh, wow, well, okay. Yeah, I was there for four years or so. Makes, okay, well, then you know the area. Yep, good spot. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, ladies, for both agreeing to be on the show. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having us. Absolutely. So um, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, this is In the Know with Kat Babino, myself, and I love talking to wonderful people in STEM. And I saw you guys, uh, the Blue Latitudes Foundation online, and I sent you a message. So I would love for you guys to let me know about Blue Latitudes. Sure, absolutely. Sure. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that focuses on research, education, and outreach in a really unique areas of our oceans. It's an area where industry and the environment intersect. And we are really on a mission to find silver linings in our oceans where that intersection actually has a positive impact on our environments. And one great example of that is Reefs to Reef, where we repurpose old oil and gas, offshore oil and gas platforms into artificial reefs, into habitats that can um, really benefit uh, fish communities and coral reef habitats throughout the world. So that's one of our big initiatives and uh, yeah, we're, we're excited to be here today. 
Awesome. So how long has Blue Latitudes been doing this? We, we were founded in 2018, but our work really began when Emily and I met in graduate school at Scripps Institution of Oceanography back in 2014. And we did a joint thesis project on investigating the environmental, social, and ecological implications of reefing platforms in California. So as part of that, we really were introduced to this idea of as reefs and we really became passionate about it. Uh, we started the Blue Latitudes LLC, which is a women-owned marine environmental consulting firm right after graduate school. And we actually, because we did so much education outreach on profit-based work, we actually had a fiscal partnership with Mission Blue, which is Dr. Sylvia Earle's nonprofit. She's a world-renowned ocean explorer and National Geographic um, uh -huh. fellow. So she <laughs> mentored us from about 2015 to 2018 when we, when we finally had um, enough resources behind us to form our own foundation. So we've been active since then and now we are officially functioning as Blue Latitudes Foundation. Okay, well, that is awesome. So um, I will let you ladies tell us a little bit about your history. So Emily, what is your uh, educational history? How'd you get involved in oceanography? Sure, sure. So um, I'm actually originally from New Hampshire um, and I did my undergrad at Connecticut College, which is a small college on the East Coast. I got my degree in environmental science. Um, and right out of undergrad, I had the opportunity to go and work on the BP oil spill as a field tech. Um, and it was kind of during that time that I, you know, it was the first time I ever saw an oil platform. It's the first time I did extensive field work on the ocean. Um, and it was, you know, that during that time we were doing field sampling. So we were doing biota sampling, water sampling, sediment sampling, so that we could understand the full extent of the oil spill. And at that time, the fishermen that had lost their jobs, a lot of them were driving boats for BP and they would just rave about how unbelievable the fishing was on these offshore oil platforms, which at the time seemed really bizarre because here we are, you know, cleaning up the impacts from this bill. And they're also saying they're really healthy marine habitats where they just can't wait to go fishing. So that was kind of my first interest in the Rig Stories program. It was the first time I heard about it. And I continued working in environmental consulting for about a year and a half before deciding I got to go back to school and make the jump back into the marine sciences. Um, so I moved to California and got my degree, uh, my master's degree at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and Marine Biodiversity and Conservation, which is where I met Amber. And um, that's where we did our, we did a joint thesis project on implementing the feasibility of a rigs to program in California. Awesome, okay. Well, welcome to the West Coast. How about you, Amber? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am a West Coast native, born and raised in California. And I, you know, grew up looking at these be at these oil platforms from my beach chair, but I had no idea that there was, you know, this these incredible ecosystems below the surface. But I was always really passionate about the oceans and about marine science. So I pursued that for my undergraduate degree at UC Berkeley. And when I graduated, ended up getting a job with Google, but in this really niche program called Google Ocean. And we were in partnership with Dr. Sylvia Earle's nonprofit. What we did is we were actually going out and collecting information on our oceans and sharing them through Google Earth and Google Maps to get people around the world engaged and excited about our oceans and preserving healthy oceans. Um, one of the big projects that we did was we launched an underwater street view. So you know how you can go into street view and virtually yeah. house and all that where well, you can virtually dive on coral reefs in Google Maps. So that was a really cool way to engage and educate people about the oceans all around the world. So I really became passionate about communicating the value of a healthy ocean, especially using technology. And so when I went, to get my master's degree at Scripps and met Emily, and she told me about this, this issue going on with rigs to reefs in the Gulf of Mexico and her experience um, as a field tech down, down in the Gulf. I was fascinated because I said, you know, we have oil platforms here off of our coast in California. You know, could those be viable reef ecosystems as well? And if they are, 
how would I communicate that value to my fellow peers, my fellow Californians here who really most of us have a pretty negative perception of offshore oil and gas. So yes. how could that be a positive thing? I was really intrigued by that, by the communication challenge involved there. So Emily and I decided to team up and really investigate this idea further. And, um, you know, it's led us to this exciting place where we see oil platforms in every ocean and many of them are viable reef habitats. And so what we do in our work is to better understand those ecosystems and talk about how ocean conservation is not always us against them, marine scientists against oil companies, but perhaps there's a space for us to work together towards a better future and a cleaner ocean. That is amazing. Um, one of the main things I'm taking from this is Google Ocean. I didn't even know that was a thing that you can go to street view in the ocean. Is that up now? Can people do that currently? Yeah, yeah. It's googlemaps.com backslash oceans. Okay, well, okay. I learned something new today. Um, but other than that, like this sounds amazing as a Californian and someone in science, you know, I, I already know the beef when it comes to oil rigs and the oil platforms in the ocean, which... I'll be honest, I, I've always had a negative view of this, but um, with your program and your foundation, Blue Latitudes, I, this is kind of more information than I think the average person has on these platforms. So that's a really amazing thing that you ladies are doing and spreading Thank the word. Thank you. I, I think we totally share your perspective. I mean, most mm -hmm. people, unless you're a diver or a fisherman or who's actually been out to those platforms, you would have no idea that below the surface, there could be so much more. So, I mean, it was a surprise to me, a surprise to Emily, but you know, we've learned that it really does create a habitat and a space for these ecosystems. Wow, that is awesome. So when, it, uh, when you got started with the diving and the platforms, like how did that like open your eyes to what's going on in the oceans and the more positive look that you found? Well, I think for us, you know, uh, the oil platforms from a distance, it's really easy to think about it as somebody else's problem. But then you remember most of us drive cars, most of us run the lights in our homes, use plastics. In a lot of ways, we're all equally responsible for those offshore oil and gas platforms that are out there. And it's much easier to have the perception of just get rid of them, take them down. You know, I don't want to see them anymore versus thinking about, well, what are the impacts of completely removing them? And what if that means removing an, an ecosystem? And in these cases, these ecosystems can be as large as the empire state building. Cause that's how big these platforms are. And in California, a lot of research has come out showing that they're some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet which is crazy for an offshore oil and gas platform. Yeah. So I think when you think about it from that perspective, it's like, maybe that's not the best idea is to completely remove these productive ecosystems, especially when you consider the fact that we're losing our natural reefs at such an astounding rate that maybe there's a way to preserve more habitat, even if it just happens to be on an offshore oil and gas platform. Right. That's very, yeah, very, there's a very, very different way of thinking is what I'll say. And it's, it's opening my eyes and I'm sure other people's eyes to what's going on. Um, so when you say these are ecosystems, what type of organisms are you finding in these ecosystems? Yeah, so these platforms, they mimic the natural environments in which they're placed. So here in California, we're gonna see scallops, mussels, sea anemones that are encrusting the beams and cross beams. And then swimming around, we'll see, you know, the same sort of fish species that you might see out on our natural California Rocky Reef or even in our kelp forests. I don't know if you're familiar with the Garibaldi, it's our California state saltwater fish, bright orange, looks like a gigantic goldfish, but they nest and make their permanent home out there. We even have rockfish with our, some of California's most commercially valuable species that are known to um, actually have their babies at the base of these platforms where there are massive shell mounds and it's um, 
a protected nursery ground for and habitat for rockfish, rockfish, which is really a, a viable and an important species for our local commercial fishermen. Okay, okay. So um, I know a lot of diving goes into this. How did you ladies get into the diving aspect? Well, I actually, I, I'm from a family of divers. My dad was a big diver. My mom's a diver. My brother's a diver. So as soon as my brother and I were of age, so I was 12, he got us certified and um, we started diving as a family, which was one really cool to go diving as a family. I felt really fortunate to be able to do that. But that's really what opened my eyes to the underwater world um, and got me super into diving. And um, as my diving career progressed, I went and did my master's and, uh, or my dive master. And then, you know, my um, scientific divers license, those experiences, not only shaped who I was as a diver, maybe a better diver, but also really broadened my perspectives about all the possibilities that exist in terms of exploring our oceans. Wow. Okay. How about you, Amber? So for me, I learned how to dive after college and I actually got certified on Catalina Island, which is an incredible place to learn. There are beautiful kelp forests there and really pretty much got me hooked on, on the sport. Um, Emily and I, when we got our master's degree at Scripps, we had the opportunity to take um, a scientific diving course and that was a really bonding experience for both of us because it was a very challenging course. We had to do, um, you know, they put you out on a night dive and didn't give you, you know, any direction of, you had to figure your way home using your compass and a very small flashlight. So these sort of intense extreme environments and extreme um, experiences that really bonded us, but um, were also really a, a cool way to learn about our oceans and, and the sport of diving. And you know what? I was just going to say, I wish I dived more and I didn't even know about scientific diving, but that just made me not want to learn anything about science. <laughs> it sounds fun. And, you know, you watch programs like, um, what was that program that was on the D Disney channel, Blue Oceans or something like that, which... Uh -huh. I'm sure a lot of those are very, very talented divers, especially scientific divers. So, you know, a lot of the things about doing the podcast is opening people's minds to different careers in STEM. And I think with you ladies, you've already mentioned starting a foundation, but scientific diving or working for Google and, you know, just being um, certified in different avenues of diving is more jobs than I think the average person even realizes are available. So, I mean, kudos to you ladies for having such a phenomenal life thus far and all the things that you have accomplished. So um, tell us about Blue Latitudes Foundations, how people can be involved or what are you doing currently, even if, though it's a pandemic? That's a great question, um, especially considering everything during the pandemic has changed. And especially considering, you know, we're divers and a lot of our work is under the water. So really we that's been curbed a lot. So we needed to start to think creatively. Um, so Blue Latitudes, typically historically in the past, we did a lot of um, public engagement activities like going to do beach cleanups locally. Um, we also always did a big Patty Women's Dive Day event, which is um, a date in June where we all go out to well, it's a worldwide event, but for us, we always take a group of women divers out to the offshore oil platforms to introduce them to those ecosystems. But COVID hit, and so we needed to pivot and think about, okay, how can we still keep the public engaged, but also continue our scientific initiative? And we did, developed a community or community science research initiative utilizing remotely operated vehicles. So we're still in development stages of it, but our hope is to be able to virtually take the public diving with us by utilizing these, our ROV is essentially like an underwater drone, like you'd see in the sky, um, mm -hmm. but to collect data on our offshore oil platforms, but take the public diving with us virtually. Um, so that's something we're really excited about. And it's something, you know, that the armchair scientists can do and get involved in. That's awesome. So with your uh, Patty Day diving, do women have to be expert divers to come with you or novice divers? How does that one work? Hopefully that will come back in the near future with the pandemic being over. 
women can can participate in a women's dive day and if we go out onto the oil platforms that is a more advanced dive because you're in a blue ocean setting and there are currents and you, you do have to be an advanced diver for that specific dive but there have been some occasions where maybe we'll do a several dives around patty women women's dive day including those that are you know right off the beach or off a pier, something that could welcome more novice divers. And all women on that day can go out and do a dive event just as they'd like, you know, media tag Patty or Patty Women's Dive Day. It's something, like Emily mentioned, it's a global global day recognizing and honoring women in the sport of diving. Awesome, okay. So um, with that, the foundation is doing or was doing a lot of different things and um, because I found you guys on the internet of course doing these amazing pictures and dives and and research um what do you see as the future for blue latitudes and what do you see as the future for reinventing these oil rigs well that's a great question um and I think it's something we've been asking ourselves a lot more recently given the change in global circumstances and how we want to change our approach to solving different problems. And, you know, even given the changes in the most recent election, we have an opportunity here with someone we're hoping will be a greener president um, and open up more opportunities for marine conservation. Um, So for us, you know, we look at the oil platforms as just one example of where industry and environment intersect, but we believe there's a lot more opportunity where that Um, that follows in that same vein. For example, in New England, they don't have offshore oil platforms, but they're building offshore wind farms. And there's a likelihood that many of those offshore wind farms are also home to unique marine ecosystems. So our hope is that we can start to um, propagate this rigs to reefs concept across a variety of different industries to start to think creatively about how we're managing those offshore resources and how we're going to manage those resources at the end of their useful lives. Okay. Okay. That's really amazing. So um, with that going on, I can windmill farming. That is a new one, you know, (laughs) offshore wind. But I mean, I guess it makes sense. Um, But yes. So with the, what you're doing with the rigs, um, I was looking at your website. And so is it something where once the, the platform is done, they flip it on its side or is that something you guys are pushing for them to do to flip over or cut off in the middle for the um, reefs to form? Yeah. So through the rigs to reef program, there are several different decommissioning options and no matter which option they choose, the oil well is always sealed and capped in the exact same way. And the oil companies actually retain liability for that well in perpetuity. So should there ever be a spill or a leak or anything like that, they're always going to be responsible. But what we're talking about where the reef is developed and growing is on the actual platform jacket itself. So that's like the scaffolding of the building, beams and cross beams that extend from sea floor to sea surface. And in many cases, since that structure was first placed in the water column, marine life has started to already develop and grow there. Um, any, most things you put in the ocean is gonna to start to attract life because marine life is attracted to hard structure. First you see small invertebrates and you know little corals that start to grow and over time they form a more productive dense ecosystem that then attracts fish and then larger predators like sharks or things like that. So that's sort of the development of a reef over time. So depending on how long that platform has been in the water column and also where it is in the world, because not every oil platform is a good candidate to, not every oil platform is a good candidate to be reefed Mm -hmm. or needs to be addressed on a case by case basis. But let's say you do have a good candidate. There are typically three options for decommissioning it as a reef. One, you can remove the upper 80 feet so that ships can safely draft over the top of it, or you could topple it on its side, or you could lift the actual platform jacket and tow it to an area of the ecosystem need and place it there in that area. So those are three options that are typically utilized when reefing a structure. And, um, you know, 
it's interesting. It really just depends on where you, where the platform is and which option is, you know, makes the most sense. Okay. Okay. That's really good. Um, I'm going to get back to more personal questions. I know that Emily, you talked about diving as a youth with your family, uh, but was science always a part of both of your backgrounds before college? Yes, I would always say, I would say that the sciences was something that I was always interested in. Did I know that I wanted to study oil platforms at the age of 10? Absolutely not. (laughs) But I did know that, uh, you know, I loved the sciences. I loved being outside. I loved being in the ocean. You know, I loved collecting millions of crabs and bringing home buckets. And, you know, I, that was always something I was interested in. It's also something I always struggled in. Um, I was not the best student in math. Um, Chemistry was my nightmare. So it's certainly an area that I had to work extra hard in to do well in, but it was, I really do think it was fueled by the fact that I loved it so much. And I was really just fascinated by the natural world. Okay. What about you, uh, Amber? Well, I, I definitely had a passion and a curiosity for the natural world and the ocean around me, but I didn't, I wasn't really, I never really identified it as an interest in science until college because I grew up in a family. My mom's an artist. My dad is in real estate and development. So science wasn't necessarily something that we talked about around the dinner table. But when I went to college and really learned about what careers are out there in STEM and how I could take this passion and curiosity I had for the ocean and translate it not only into my academic pursuits, but then a future career, that was something that really came, came to me in college. Awesome. So if somebody was interested in the work you're doing, um, such as the diving, such as the scientific research, what would be uh, some inspirational things you would tell them or what would you, how would you guide them into this type of work? Oh, that's a good question. And I think, you know, growing up similar to Amber, I didn't know any other scientists. I didn't know any women scientists. Um, You know, I always, was fascinated by Jacques Cousteau, but I, you know, I was, it wasn't until later in life that I heard about Sylvia Earle and all these other wonderful female scientists. So I struggled in trying to find a community around me that was interested in those same areas. Mm. But a big thing that worked for me was um, I did a lot of volunteering on the side, you know, through college and, you know, working, I worked at the Marine Biological Lab at Woods Hole during college. And that kind of introduced me you know, to my first kind of space of other people that were interested in the marine scientists, Mm -hmm. marine sciences. Um, But as I've gotten older, I realized there's so many more opportunities. I was like, why did I not know about these? Like, I need to like shout it from the rooftops about all these amazing opportunities. You know, locally in New England, I know of a lot, but even here in San Diego, there's so many different clubs and so many different ocean entities and nonprofit groups that are doing everything from beach cleanups to, you know, volunteering at local labs at, you know, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography um, or local dive groups. You know, once you get involved with diving, that's also a really, really great way to meet people that are interested in the marine sciences, whether or not they're career sciences or they're just people that are fascinated by the ocean or love the ocean. Mm -hmm. Diving is a great way to get involved and enmeshed within the marine science community for sure. Um, That's, those would definitely be some of my recommendations. Awesome. And if I, I mean, Emily's definitely hitting it home there with, with that, with those recommendations, but I would also have to add to that, that um, for me, I really, I had, I was, I knew I was passionate and curious about the oceans and that's always been a big fueling factor for, for the work that I've done, but I've also had to maintain and, and remain very open to new opportunities because as Emily mentioned earlier, when I was younger, I don't think I ever would have said that this is where I'd be today and that this is what I'd be studying. But being flexible and being open to learning new things and trying new things to see what fits and what feels right and what you really enjoy. I think getting your hands in a lot of different pots, saying yes to those opportunities and and trying to learn through them is a really great way to, um, to get to your destination, whether that be uh, in college or in a STEM-based career. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to both of you for that. Have you ever heard of STEM Seeds? No. So that's a, a program that I was invited to do as a teacher's aide, but it's a, a program that takes you, take undergrad students out on a research boat. And so it's a research boat. What, which one was, I was on the uh, Sekuliak and it's from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And what it, they do is between uh, research missions, when they're moving the boat, they take students on it for a week so they can see what it's like to do research on a boat. Uh, oceanography, they'll have a professor on there who'll teach them geography, oceanography, things like that. That's but so um, awesome. Yeah, I know. And then, of course, with the pandemic, it's not like they are doing anything now. But if, I think you ladies would have a good time if you were involved as a teacher. They'll, uh, they will fund your way to go wherever the boat is. And then you just wow. sell on it for a week teaching oh undergrad. Gosh, that is so, so cool. cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was able to sell with them in Alaska through the Bering Reef or the Bering Sea. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, <laughs> this, yeah. you're on this nice blue ocean, you're seeing all the glaciers, everything like that. It, wow. it was a great experience. That is so oh my amazing. Gosh. Plus exposure to all those resources that you would like really rarely have an opportunity to like, I mean, seeing the scientific equipment, all that stuff. That's so mm -hmm. awesome. Yes. I am. Um, I asked because I don't remember her name, unfortunately, but I think it was at least two people there that was from Scripps. So I, I know people from Scripps go on it, help out oh, on the yeah. research boat. Wow. So it's, it's a cool program. Um, we'll definitely hopefully. check that out. Yeah, yeah hopefully in awesome. the future, check those out because it's really, it's a really fun, really fun thing. Um, yeah. But pre-pandemic, outside of Blue Latitudes, what is some somewhere we would find you ladies or something you would be doing that's fun for yourself? Well, I know you could probably, Emily and I, have, we both have two dogs that we really love. And so you would often find us um, running our dogs in the morning or taking them to the beach hanging out with our families. That's something that we, you know, really love to do in our free time. <laughs> it's true. Right? Then like Wait. the sad thing is, and maybe it's not a sad thing. It's probably a positive thing. Amber and I basically do everything together and our company <laughs> kind of bleeds into that. So usually weekends we're together and during the weekdays we're together. Um, but that means we get to do a lot of really cool adventures that are even outside of diving. So whether that's camping or going hiking, we do we make a lot of fun activities for ourselves, even if that means we're spending all our time together. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I mean, it just means that uh, your personal life is integrated with your business, which everybody can't say. And you know, sometimes that's actually more fun than not more fun, you know, so I get to, yeah, I I'm, I'm get to do my podcast and my job realized I was doing a podcast and they were like, why don't you help us do a podcast? Okay. You know, hey, hey, awesome. combine passions. Right. I don't have a problem with adding that to my already too much list of things that I do, but that's, um, <laughs> that's really cool. What kind of dogs do you have? So I have a flat coated retriever, which basically looks like a brown golden retriever. His name's Hunter. <laughs> oh. Yes. And I have a golden doodle named Bailey. Oh, I have a Yorkie named Travis. And he's all Aww. of this big. And uh, but he thinks he's a hundred pounds, which is hilarious. <laughs> so that's really cool. Um, and I'm not gonna hold you ladies too long this evening, but is there one last thing you would like to share? or tell anyone how to, uh, what, what do you think is inspirational about what you do? Hmm. Oh my goodness. Well, I know that at least for Californians that right now we know more than, we know more about these platform rafes than we ever have. And this is a really unique time where our legislators actually considering the option of decommissioning some of our platforms as roofs. And because of that, we've actually launched a petition in partnership with Patagonia and it's live on our website. You can sign the petition 
to say, you know what, we'd like the state to consider rigs to reefs as an option in California. And so showing public support that say, you know what, we'd like them to consider this, we want it to be a viable option in California. We're hosting that, that um, petition. And so anybody who is listening to this and says, this is great, what can I do to actualize that in California? You could head to our website and sign that petition and show your support. Awesome, thank you. What about you, Emily? I would just say that um, <clears throat> it's always worthwhile to follow your passions. And even if that means that you're doing it on the side or doing a side hustle, that means you get to touch on your passion. Eventually that will lead to something else bigger than you could ever possibly imagine. Amber did this and I did this as a side hustle for a long time, both working full-time jobs on the side of starting our own company. And it eventually ended up paying out, but following your passions is never a bad idea. And being able to incorporate that in your daily life, I think can really lead to fulfillment and, you know, creativity in ways that you didn't really necessarily expect. So I think very often people let go of their passions because they just want to get back to the daily grind. But I do think there's always opportunities to follow your passion and incorporate it into your everyday life. Awesome. And how can people find more information about your foundation? We are on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Blue Latitudes Foundation. And we're also on a website, bluelatitudesfoundation.org. And we have a uh, YouTube channel too called Science C TV, um, where you, we do different, we take you on different research expeditions with us and um, interview other women marine scientists as well. Awesome. Well, thank you ladies so much for being a part of the show. Um, I hope that you are have a wonderful uh, evening and hopefully, hopefully this pandemic will subside soon and we can get back to our normal lives. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Kat. Yes. All right. Have a good evening. You, you too. too. Bye. Bye.